Hey guys, hope you're all doing good and hanging in there. Um, so over the weekend, I asked you to send me some questions on my Instagram story and on YouTube community as well, because I have not done a Q&A video on my channel in what feels like forever. So you sent me a bunch of questions, I'm gonna answer as many as I can in this video. So first, we have a question from Dave Lewis, and his question is, what was your most memorable aha moment when learning music theory? So what was my most, what was the that light bulb moment for me? Um, I don't know if I had like a, a single moment where I was like, all oh, right, I get it now. It was a collection of those. And I think it all happened when I actually started applying the theory that I was learning to the instrument, to the guitar. And basically that means that when I was in high school, I was taught classical music theory because a common requirement of a lot of UK universities to get uh, into a music degree is to have um, grade five theory ABRSM at grade five theory, which is classical theory. So you have to sit an exam at grade five and, and pass that to um, have a chance of getting on a music degree. So I did that. And then when I got to uni, we had two, uh, well, we had one module over two years called, I think it was like general music skills or general music theory, something like that. But basically everyone on my degree course, guitarists, bassists, drummers, vocalists, producers, everyone was, was taught theory in this very like generalized format um, in these classes that was not, it wasn't specific uh, to our individual instruments. And so a lot of us didn't really know what to do with the information that we were being taught. And so when I started applying that to the guitar, I, you know, I had a lot of moments where I was like, oh, okay, that's how to build this chord or that's how to play this scale. Next up, Sean Ashley asks, Okay, for fun, you're gonna to put together your dream band. You need to fill the spot of at least another guitar player, a singer, a bassist, and a drummer, and you can hire anyone who's in your band. So I think the rhythm section, uh, drums and bass, would be two of my best friends. Um, not just because they're friends, but because they're two of the best musicians I've ever played with. So uh, my friend Jordan Harvey, uh, he is, you know, he's a singer in a band in America called King Calloway right now, but, Prior to that, um, he was he was mainly a drummer, and you know he's an absolutely phenomenal drummer. So I'd have him him on drums. My friend Duncan Robertson on bass. He's a session player down in London. Awesome guy, incredible musician as well. For a singer, um, I think I'd probably go for like a pop rock thing. So maybe Adam Levine from Maroon Five. I think he's got an awesome voice. Whether you like Maroon Five or not, I think it's hard to argue that. Um, and another guitar player, uh, I would have Tim Pierce in my band. I think that would be a, a sick band. A strange band, but sick nonetheless. Who's your favorite guitarist? Um, I have a bunch. I think Slash is always gonna be like my number one guitar idol, but it would be him, uh, Joe Bonamassa, Brent Mason, and Brad Paisley, and Derek Trucks. Those would be my top, however many that was. Did you study or have formal music training? Who do you admire the most in terms of guitar playing? Okay, well, I just answered the last question. Um, but the first question, yeah, I studied uh, an undergraduate um, bachelor's degree with honors in popular music at Edinburgh Napier University. I graduated three years ago. I don't know how to say this username, but they're asking me, have I met someone who started late in guitar and reached a really great playing level, uh, 20s or more? Not personally, but I'm sure there are plenty of guitar players out there who maybe started in their 20s and are now, you know, phenomenal players. It's just obviously when you're much younger, you've got so much free time on your hands to practice. And so that's why typically, um, you know, the pros, the more experienced players started when you find that they started when they were younger, obviously. Probably don't need to explain that, but um, no, not personally, but I'm sure they're out there. Uh, Anna Rook. Guha Thakurta just murdered the pronunciation of your name. Sorry. Uh, when you are improvising, do you follow your ear or do you consciously think about highlighting the changes using triads, modes, and chord tones or whatever? It's kind of a combination of the both, of, of the two. Um, so, and it depends what I'm playing over. If it's something quite simple, then I'm mostly just following my ear and sometimes I feel like I'm just kind of watching my fingers do the work. Um, but if it's something a 
bit more harmonically dense, then I will have to rely more on my knowledge of theory to to navigate the chord changes and, and make things sound good. But yeah, it's uh, I think the more and more you play, the more experience you have, uh, the less you rely on the theory that you've studied. You know, a lot of great players say, not just guitar players, but musicians in general say, you know, you learn the theory and then you forget it. And that's not exactly true. I mean, you don't literally forget it, but I totally understand what they're saying. Um, you know, you think less and less about it as time goes on. Uh, Silly Charvel asks, what's the utmost importance of playing in any given key? Also, how many keys are there? Well, according to Victor Wooten, there are 30. I would have said 24. But I remember watching a video of Victor Wooten explain why it's actually 30 keys. I can't remember what the reason was. and I need to go and watch that video again, but yeah, 30 keys apparently. What's the utmost importance of playing in any given key? Um, oh, there are a bunch of reasons. I mean, one would be if you're, you know, singers uh, often need to change the key of a song on the fly. You know, like if you're in a wedding band or a function band, you turn up one night and your singer's ill and they can't really sing as high as they are used to singing. Uh, you might need to change the key of the songs and um, and just be able to do it on the fly. Uh, so it's important to be able to do that and not waste time on stage. And also uh, different songs are in different keys. So you're never going to be playing in the same key for the rest of your life. So you might as well learn how to do it. Chris Hunt asks, players and non-players who watch you may well think, man, I wish I could do that. What are the non-guitar things you see people doing that you wish you could if there were enough hours in the waking day? That's an awesome question. Um, so I think the first thing would be uh, learning another language. When I see people that are you know, bilingual, I, I get a bit jealous or envious and I, I kind of think, oh man, I, sh I really should have invested time in learning another language when I was younger and I had more free time. Um, I actually bought a course on Russian uh, last year, which I've, you know, I've done a few lessons on, but I'm, uh, yeah, I can't remember any of it. But I would definitely like to learn Russian uh, so that I could eventually travel there one day and like interact with the locals. That's kind of a, you know, goal of mine for the future. So learn another language would be one. Another is um, related to fitness. I, I think like people who do calisthenics like all these mad like handstand exercises and uh, um, you know weird sit-ups and pull-ups and all that all that stuff that uh, that really impresses me and it's something that I'd like to learn how to do myself so learn another language and calisthenics are two things that I wish I could do uh, Santiago Gutierrez uh, so when are we gonna see a collaborative video of you and Rhett Shaw well we've actually already done a few so um, there's one on my channel. Um, if you just search, if you just search for Rhett Shaw on my channel, you'll find that video. We did one in Nashville two years ago, and then I was in his Summer Nam vlog last summer. So that's on his channel, obviously, and I was also on his podcast, The Backstage Journal, a few months ago. Okay, now I'm gonna look at some questions on Instagram. So Dan Smith asks, how do you balance the blues vocabulary and traditional aspect with trying to have your own voice? It's a great question. Um, when I'm improvising over a blues, I try to just let my mind go blank. Like I, I'll almost always start off with some, you know, traditional, somewhat cliche sounding blues licks because I, I still enjoy playing that kind of stuff. Um, and I find that when I just uh, go with the flow and let ideas come to me and, and try things out that maybe won't sound good but are a bit of a risk that's when i find that my voice as a player um comes through uh, in amongst all of the traditional blues licks that we've all he heard a thousand times before um yeah i just try to you know i go with the flow when i'm improvising and i just i'll, I'll try new things out like on the fly and sometimes they'll work sometimes they won't but occasionally uh you'll find that you develop, you know, really cool, unexpected licks as a result of just letting your mind go blank. How do you like the D'Angelico Premiere DC with the Mojo Tone pickups? Also, does the guitar stay in tune well? Yeah, the guitar actually stays in tune really well, which is surprising because it's, you know, that headstock type, whether it's on an expensive guitar or an inexpensive guitar, usually is 
quite troublesome when it comes to tuning stability, but for some reason the D'Angelico um, is, is really quite stable. And the Mojo Tone pickups are awesome. I love them, they were exactly what I'm looking for, what I was looking for, and so I enjoy playing that guitar even more now. Andrew asks, do you play any other instruments? How do you get gigs as just a guitarist? Um, I'll answer that first question. Uh, so yeah, I, I do play the fiddle, sort of. That was my first instrument. I played it from when I was nine up until 15. When I got to fit age 15, I just kind of gave it up because I decided I, I just did not enjoy playing it at all. And I would rather spend more time playing guitar. But a few years ago, uh, I started a wedding band with some friends, which I actually just left. Um, but we we used to do a live Kaylee at a lot of weddings. So a Kaylee is um, a bunch of traditional Scottish dances played to traditional Scottish folk music. And so if it's authentic, it's, you know, you have a, a live fiddle player and or a live accordion player. And so I decided that I would pick up the fiddle again and try and get my technique um, back back in order somewhat so that we could do live Kaylee and uh, attract more clients that way. Uh, but I've since left the wedding, wedding band and so I don't think I'll ever pick up the fiddle again. How about song lessons or lessons of some solos slash riffs? Love your channel though. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I'll ever do song lessons because I don't feel that's my forte and I feel like there's a lot of channels out there that do a great job of that. But I do like the idea of potentially breaking down some of my favorite solos in a way that talks about the theory behind them and uh, you know just helps people understand why they sound the way that they do. But you know there are potential copyright issues that come with uh, the territory when you do that. So I'm not sure, I'll have to have a think about that because generally I've been very lucky and not getting any sort of copyright issues with my channel so far. Um, so I don't really want to test that, but we'll see, it's a, it's a good suggestion. Quick practical tip for getting away from the pentatonic boxes, please. Uh, yeah, start learning and improvising with uh, the larger scales that the pentatonic scales are built from. For example, you know, the minor pentatonic, that's derived from a larger seven note scale called the natural minor major pentatonic, as you might have guessed, is based, uh, it's a five note scale based on a larger seven note scale called the major scale. Um, so start, you know, trying to incorporate notes from those scales into your pentatonic licks, essentially. If you're playing in a minor key, then, you know, play some minor pentatonic licks, but also um, add in some, you know, ninths, minor sixths, notes that are not in the minor pentatonic but are in the natural minor scale and same thing for when you're playing in a major key you know add in notes that are found in the major scale but are not found in the major pentatonic and then another suggestion would be incorporate triads into your playing because triads are a really great tool to use uh, for highlighting chord changes in your solo. So that's another way to, to play very melodically in a solo and not sound like you're just playing through the same, you know, five pentatonic box shapes all the time. Can you do a video on interval training and ear training? Well, if I was to do that, well, first start, interval training is a big part of ear training, a big part of basic ear training. Um, but if I was to do a video on ear training, on how to do it, it would just be me telling you to go and find an ear training program online and start studying ear training with it because that's what I did. Um, I mean, I know Rick Beato, I think he's just launched his own ear training program, so I'm sure that's worth checking out. I use something called Ear Master Pro, which I would also re recommend looking into. Um, I'm sure there's a bunch of free resources out there for it, um, but you know, there's a lot of options. And another fun thing that you can do, um, not even in your practice time, but just, you know, when you're, you know, chilling out at home, watching something on Netflix or on TV, whenever there's like a theme song for a show, don't skip the intro, listen to it and see if you can work out the melody on guitar or work out the chord progression that's used in the song. That's a fun way, a fun, like very casual way of, of training your ear. Um, 
that doesn't really feel like your training practice. If you could only keep one of your guitars, which one would you keep? I would keep my Les Paul. It's a very special guitar. Okay, let's go back to some YouTube questions because there were some more. Amit Fernandez asks, were you nervous, anxious, or feeling stupid when you started your channel? When did you feel the tides turn? Was there a single event or general time where you felt the return on your effort or felt like you just may be a successful YouTuber someday? So this channel has been on the go for a very long time. I mean, I started it in like 2009 or 2010, I think, and just occasionally uploaded covers, which um, are probably private now. And then before I started teaching guitar on YouTube, when I was still at university, I, I used to do like a weekly vlog, which I did for six months. And that didn't really go anywhere. So uh, yeah, when I was doing vlogs, I did, I did feel nervous doing that because that just, it felt, strange, very foreign to me. I mean, vlogging is a strange thing to do uh, in general. I enjoy watching vlogs, but <clears throat> actually making them yourself and putting yourself in that position is it's a strange feeling. Um, so I realized that vlogging wasn't for me. Uh, and so, yeah, I did feel nervous, a bit stupid doing that, but I, I was glad I did it. It was a learning experience for sure. Um, the moment I felt the tides turn, uh, was luckily only a few months into me teaching guitar on YouTube. I had a video called the John Mayer 7th that I uploaded in October 2017 and that got like 80,000 views in a week um, just out of the blue when all of my other videos had gotten like maximum like 400 after months. And so that was, um, you know, that was a very exciting time for me because I, I was like, oh, right, this is actually starting to work now. And it was right at the moment that I was kind of contemplating looking for a part-time job because up until then, I'd just been living off money from uh, wedding gigs, which were drying up because, you know, we're moving into winter and that's generally how it goes for wedding bands. Um, so yeah, that was the moment that I felt like there was, you know, return uh, on my efforts. Vary Ravano asks, any chance of you putting out your own music anytime soon? Yeah, I think before the end of this year, I'm gonna put out a single. Um, I have some ideas of things that I've been working on. It'll pro probably be something instrumental. And I like the idea of just, you know, getting some friends together, musician friends of mine, um, having a couple of rehearsals, getting into a studio, getting like a film crew to come in and film it uh, so that I can put it on YouTube. And then just seeing what the response is from one track because I don't really um, like the idea of, of slaving away at an EP for months on end uh, before hearing any uh, feedback on it. So yeah, I'd like to put out a single before the end of the year. Josh Kirk asks, what is your dream acoustic guitar and why? You know, acoustic guitar playing doesn't really do anything for me. I only do it when I feel like I have to, if a gig calls for it, you know? Um, that might sound weird to some people, but that's just the way I've always been. Uh, that being said though, when I was in Dublin last year, I went to a guitar shop and picked up a Yamaha, I think it's called Transatlantic or something like that, or Transacoustic. Um, but it's basically one of those acoustic guitars that allows you to dial in like reverb, delay, chorus, um, all, and it all comes out of the sound hole like when you're not plugged in. So it's an acoustic guitar that gives you reverb, delay, and other effects acoustically, which just blew my mind. And it was a really nice playing guitar. So if I ever buy another acoustic guitar, um, which you know is likely, of course, uh, within the next few years, it will probably be one of those Yamaha um, trans, whatever they were. Where did you get that haircut? Veen Barbers, Leith Walk, Edinburgh. Can't tell if you're asking because you love it or hate it, but. I like it, so. John Carr asks, how did you get to be so good after only 14 years? How much is natural aptitude? Well, first off, thanks very much, John. That's kind of you to say. Um, I'm not really sure how to answer the, the, the second half of that, but I feel like 14 years is a long time. And I'm sure there are many, many players out there who have been playing for a lesser amount of time who are as good or, you know, much better than me. Um, I will say though that when I when I went to study music uh, at university, that's when I really started to take practice seriously. 
um, for a number of years. So that's where I saw like the most, you know, the most amount of progress in my playing. It's probably when I was at university from about uh, second until my fourth year. Um, so yeah, you know, having a lot of, you know, being a music student gives you a lot of free time to practice. And so uh, I took advantage of that. Please post a link to the vendor of your guitar strap. All of my guitar straps are made by Ernie Ball. I love those straps. They are, yeah, really nice designs. What is, in your opinion, the best all round slash versatile guitar if you could pick one for all genres, essentially? The Telecaster, it's great for jazz, it's great for blues, it's great for funk, it's great for country, obviously. It's, you know, the country guitar. Um, and it's also great for rock. You know, the, the bridge single coil on a telly, uh, sounds so thick compared to you know the bridge single coil on a strat so it's much better at getting some you know big beefy rock riffs out of it um so that's why i think it's the most versatile versatile electric out there okay my camera looks like it's about to die so maybe a couple more uh, andy dion asks any advice for musicians to grow on youtube and instagram like myself yeah i would say your number one priority has to be your skill set. Uh, you said musician, so I don't know if you just mean that you're a guitar player or a multi instrumentalist or whatever it may be. Um, make your main skill set your priority. So if you're a guitar player, that means practice guitar and work towards being the best guitar player that you possibly can be day in, day out. That should be your priority over gaining a following. But then when it comes to actually building a following, you know, the same things that everyone else says be consistent, be authentic never lie to your subscribers um, quality over quantity I would say but you do also need to be consistent so you know post something at least once or twice a week and don't do like the desperate thing that I see a lot of guitar players unfortunately doing on Instagram which is to go onto someone's post um, say nothing of relevance to what they've posted and just say th something like or leave a comment saying hey check out my playing please give me a follow or, uh, or don't post a video of you playing guitar and then tag like every guitar player under the sun that you can think of in your post when you've never met them in real life. Like it just, it comes across um, as really just desperate and almost, honestly a bit rude. Um, so yeah, those are some things to not do. Those are not gonna, those things are not gonna help you grow a following. What is gonna help you grow a following is being a great musician um, and getting good at talking to a camera as well. So that's another piece of advice. Just um, get used to the fact that getting comfortable in front of a camera and talking to it, if that's something that you're shy or nervous about to begin with, um, just trust that you'll get better at it over time. This question is from Bruno. Hello, I bought your course and I really like the way you teach. Thanks very much, man. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, I was wondering if you have a tip or some advice for getting jobs globally. Currently, I live in Brazil and we don't have a strong music scene here. I would really like to do studio sessions and side person gigs. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks. Thanks for the question, man. Um, so first of all, decide where you want to go. You know, uh, in the US, like the big music cities are obviously Nashville, LA and New York. So pick one of those, I guess. And once you've decided on where you want to go, I would I would take like a minimum two week vacation uh, and go go to wherever that city may be and spend a lot of time trying to integrate yourself into the scene there. I mean, spend a lot of time just, just being social in, you know, places where there are live music and get talking to, to the local musicians. Don't try and network with the intention of immediately getting jobs because that's not going to happen. You have to go in with the attitude of, I'm just going out to like meet friends and um, I think that's a more natural way of, of going about networking rather than just, you know, running up to the first guitar player or singer you, you meet and, and shoving your business card in their face. Um, because naturally in conversation, you know, your career goals are going to come up and if they learn that you're, you know, looking for work, then, you know, they might bear you in mind for things. and. You know, then after that, if you decide that you really like that particular city, then you need to work at getting a visa, which is something I can't really uh, 
answer because I've not done that myself yet, even though it is a goal of mine to, as I've said on this channel before, get out to Nashville. Um, but yeah, just go out uh, and be social in, in the local music scenes and, and befriend people. All right, guys, it looks like we're clocking in at around 30 minutes here, maybe less than that once this is edited, but um, thanks so much for submitting all of your questions. Sorry I didn't get all, to all of them. I didn't want this video to be uh, too long. And also a lot of the questions I wasn't really confident at answering, and there were a lot of ones that were actually quite similar. Um, but anyway, yeah, thank you so much again. I hope everyone is, is coping all right with everything that's going on. And, you know, to be honest, my life isn't really changing all that much. Uh, I spend most of my time at home making lessons for YouTube anyway, so I'm gonna continue to keep doing the same and so you can expect to see more content on my channel in the near future. Yeah, wish you all the best and uh, see you in the next one.